So Kay is going to talk to us about immunosenescence, <laughs> which, or Botox, that, which is much easier to pronounce. Um, so Kay first came to talk to us about how Ebola is like the menopause um, back in the days when we thought contagious uh, infectious diseases were a cause for curiosity rather than despair. Um, but uh, she is back and this is going to be great. And over to you. Lou, thank you so much. Um, I'm kind of here to prove that you don't have to be an expert to be here. Uh, so, first of all, immunosenescence. Um, I kind of want to refer back to Roger's talk because the reason I got into this was because it was all about me. I was approached by a recruiter to offer me a non-exec directorship. Uh, so we'd had an exchange of messages through LinkedIn and then we got on a Zoom call and the recruiter took one look at me and said, um, oh my God, you're an awful lot older than I thought you would be. Have you thought of getting some work done, like maybe fillers or Botox? So I ended the call, obviously, uh, and I'd already been a bit interested in immunosenescence. But then I thought, doesn't matter how many fillers you have, how much Botox you have done, how much work you get done, BH, you can't Botox immunosenescence. So let's take a look at what it is. I'm guessing that most of you in the audience are somewhat younger than me. So I'm just going to put this up, this definition of immunosenescence, to give you something to look forward to. Lovely. Uh, it is age-related changes to susceptibility to infectious diseases, cancer, decreased responsiveness to vaccination, hello COVID, pathogenesis, cardiovascular, neurodegenerative diseases, diabetes, osteoporosis. Basically, you get more diseases as you get older and you're less good at fighting them off. Don't ask me what neurodegenerative diseases are, I can't remember. No, just kidding, obviously, obviously, yes. So there you are. Um, there is something to look forward to for you all. And also coming back to my original question, you can't Botox that bitch. Well, it's possible, I'll come on at the end to talk about what we could possibly do to reverse this. Uh, but let's think also about the true implications of bringing an end to immunosenescence. You will have a planet full of healthy old people. Oh, Joe Biden? Any? Okay, right, let's not go there, right. So here's what happens. Um, my ego gets me interested in things and then I dive into the research rabbit hole uh, anyone else signed up to academia.eu? That is where I spend my whole time in lockdown, is on academia.eu. And as I started to research immun immunosenescence, I came across another unpronounceable set of words, antagonistic pleiotropy. So pleiotropy is uh, the phenomenon by which one system produces more than one outcome. So the most common one in science is where you've got a gene that actually gives rise to two different characteristics. So for example, sickle cell anemia, um, two different characteristics of one gene lead to that disease. Antagonistic pleiotropy is when they work against each other. So sickle cell anemia is one of those. So a system has two effects which work against each other. Now, um, I like to think of this as, you know, the effect of, to hark back to Alex's talk, the effect of taking drugs, drinking and dancing all night when I was 21 made me the most brilliant human in the world. And now that I'm 66, that finished me up in hospital. So that's a kind of antagonistic pleiotropy. Um, and the very system that ensures our survival as young humans, so our immune system, 
is overstimulated and not fit for purpose in older adults. So we've got this great thing that keeps us alive when we're young, but then it, but it doesn't do us any favors as we get older. Um, I'll just show you um, another example. And after these two slides, I'd like you to have a little think and post in the chat about your own examples. So I have my own example of this. So I'm a person who runs, I run almost every day and I do some yoga. And this is a picture of me having completed the Hackney Half Marathon in 2019. And uh, so that's me. I'm really looking after myself as I age. I'm doing fine work in that. Also me. So I am an encapsulated example of antagonistic playography. And I'm going to keep talking, but I'd like you to think about what do you do where, on the one hand, I'm this, but on the other hand, I'm undermining it a bit by doing this. So moving on to the meat of the thing. This is all about the immune system, how it works and how it ages. Those of you who know me know that there's got to be three in everything I present. So here we are, here's the three. We are going to talk about thymus involution, T cell repertoire shrinkage, and chronic inflammation, also known as inflammaging. And we'll start with thymus involution. Now, I know that in the audience we have some biological scientists and some other sorts of nerds. So I just wanna be clear about the difference between thymus and thyroid people. So your thymus is the one that's kind of down, down here and your thyroid is up here. Uh, thymus is a sort of butterfly shaped thing. Um, the thymus is one of the weirdest things ever because it basically starts to die when we're really small. So as you can see up here, it atrophies from infancy. infancy. Um, and the thymus produces T cells. We need T cells and we'll come back to them. So it starts to die off basically. It's got a half-life of 16 years. This means by the time you're 16, your thymus has got half the effective mass that it had when you were born. Uh, it still has some mass because the liquid portion of the thymus is replaced by fat. And the liquid portion of most of us is replaced by fat as we get older, but that's another story for another night. Um, and thymus involution also occurs more rapidly in males than females. I have no idea why that should be. So our thymus gland deteriorates when we're very, very young. Um, so it changes from a sort of lean, mean T cell producing machine to a fat thing um, when we're very young. Part of the problem with the thymus is it was designed for a species that only lived to be between 30 and 50 years old. So if we'd known that we were gonna live to be hundreds, we might have installed a higher quality thymus. It's a bit like building a house to last a few hundred years and putting in really bad plumbing. You just should have thought of that, perhaps. So this is something that um, I want you to bear in mind, that you are carrying around an immune system which is basically not designed to last for as long as we're living. Now, T cells. I don't want to go into a great deal of detail about T cells because Alex is here and he knows way more about it than I do. And by the way, if you've got any questions after this that are sort of sciencey, ask him. So the important word here is repertoire, T cell repertoire shrinks. You don't lose numbers of T cells so much as you get older, but you do lose the variety in them. And we need here to look at two factors really, the naive T cells and the memory T cells. Now you've got to love a naive T cell. They are so adorable. 
they're like this kid that hang out outside my flat and buy and sell weed. They are just, you know, setting out on life, really having a great time. They are the migrant workers and Erasmus students of the cell world. They're just so open to every possible experience. What happens is that cells, non-differentiated non cells are born in your bone marrow. And they travel to the thymus to find out which family of cells they belong to. So these cells, they arrive at the thymus and they, they go, they're like, oh, I'm a T cell. I'm gonna be a T cell. That is cool. Cause actually being a T cell is very cool in the cell world. And some of them become killer T cells and killers work alone. And some of them become helpers. They, they help B cells. And here's how the, the naive killer T cell works. You get a virus, for example, just to be topical. And the naive T cells sees the virus coming and it goes, wow, man, you are different. Oh my God, you're really interesting. The naive T cell looks in great detail at the virus, the bacterium, whatever, looks very, very carefully at it and works out specifically how to kill that invader. So its naivety is its superpower because it works out exactly how to kill that particular invader. The helpers similar, them and the B cells together, they kind of work out exactly how to kill this particular invader. So they're just adorable, always curious. Unfortunately, once they've done that, they become memory T cells. Now, um, I'm sorry if there are, there are any racist uncles in the room, but I like to think of the memory T cell as the racist uncle of the cell world. Is this, you know, the person who goes to Spain and thinks they can shout in English, that's Spanish? Um, and it's also the sort of cell that looks at an invader and goes, oh, you're all the same, you lot. All you invaders are the same. I'll just give you the same treatment as I gave the last one. So they have no curiosity. They just have the same reaction to new invaders as they did to the old ones. And we are currently seeing that problem. So if you imagine these memory T cells in your system right now, sounding a bit like Toby Young, in fact, they're, they're seeing, sorry, we'll, we'll cut that because that's libelous. So they're seeing COVID-19 come in and they're going, oh, it's just flu, isn't it? I'll just react to it like I react to flu. So what happens is you get all the symptoms of a reaction but you don't actually kill it off. So your immune system kicks in, but it kicks in pathetically. So it's not really doing any good. Uh, the other problem that memory T cells have is that unlike naive T cells, they can self-replicate. So you get masses and masses of largely useless memory T cells floating around. So the population of T cells in your system is very much a metaphor for the population of the world right now. It's getting older, but it's not really getting more useful. So uh, the other problem with having lots of memory T cells in your T cell repertoire is that you have a dumbed down reaction to vaccines. So they react to vaccines in the same way as they react to invading diseases, which is, oh yeah, I've seen this vaccine before, I'll just chuck out more of that flu thing. So, which is why when you look at the stats on older people getting the COVID vaccine, their immunity tends to be somewhat less than young people. So there we have thymus, not fit for purpose for old people. T cell repertoire shrinks. So we've got too many racist uncle T cells and not enough curious, naive T cells. Point three. With age, the immune system starts to attack itself. Now, I'm very, very familiar with this. Like every morning I get up, I look in the mirror and go, you useless old cow, what have you done with your life? So, you know, it's, it's quite a common thing that 
people, cells, immune systems tend to turn in on themselves as they get older. And this results in a thing that's called inflammation. So you're constantly running this reaction to disease thing in your system as you get older. Uh, and some of the symptoms of this are um, obesity. So the more fat you've got in your system, the less good you are at really being effective against disease. You've got these T cells that don't know the difference between one attacker and the other. And you've got a decrease in microbiome variety, uh, which leads to gut dysbiosis. This means that um, in your microbiome, in your gut, you've got less variety of bacteria than you really need to stay healthy. So you're constantly in this sort of inflammatory state. And some of the common symptoms of this are, for example, um, arthritis. Arthritis is the immune system just starting to attack itself out of regrets, schadenfreude, whatever. So there we have the, the three elements of the immune system. Thymus evolution, T cell variety deg degradation, and this constant attacking itself. So it's looking pretty grim. So I started to ask myself, what can we do? And I came up with some ideas and I started to see if anyone else was doing it. So my first idea was this useless thymus gland thing. What if those of us of a certain age were to go out and remove the young healthy thymus glands from young people? And inspired a little bit by Alex, I was thinking, well, maybe the thymus gland of a rat would do, but probably not. And it wouldn't make half as good a horror movie, would it? So this is the script for my next horror movie. This is the boomer thymus vampires. So we all go out and start stealing healthy young thymus glands, which produce nice, naive T cells. Uh, so I started to think about that and disappeared into the tunnel of academia and lo and behold, there are researchers out there who are developing ways of rejuvenating the thymus by implanting cells from younger thymuses into our old one. So it is actually happening. There are boomer thymus vampires in the world of uh, immune system research. Something that I realized when I started looking at this was that this research on rejuvenating the thymus is only being done on men. Now, don't get me started, people. But so this is going to be what? Thymus Viagra? And by the way, if anybody's got any investment money, I think Thymus Viagra is a really great idea and please get in touch with me later. So we've got Boomer Thymus Vampires, otherwise known as Thymus Viagra, but um, presumably they will start experimenting on women at some stage. Don't get me started on the number of drugs that were never tested on women. That's for another day. So then I thought, what can we do about these memory T cells? these T cells that have forgotten how to be inquisitive and curious. Well, perhaps that recruiter wasn't far wrong. Can we do cosmetic surgery and fillers and Botox on a T cell to turn it back into an IE T cell? But then I thought, no, that might be a bit superficial. Will it really remember how to be curious? So then I thought, no, let's do political correctness training on memory T cells. So it's like you take your racist uncle and you explain to them why they've got to be an ally and not an enemy. You say to them, it is not true that all viruses are the same, mate, that you really need to look beyond the name virus and start asking them where they've come from, what they want, and so on. So we're going to start political correctness training for memory T cells. Um, and sure enough, when I started looking 
into the research, people are starting work on retraining T cells. So shifting the emphasis in your immune system as you get older from being populated by memory Ts to being populated by naive Ts. And then the final one was, so the microbiome gets dumbed down as we get older. Um, those of you not aware, the microbiome is possibly the biggest organ in the body, but it doesn't actually belong to us. It's made up of bacteria, but it's absolutely huge. And the more variety you have in your gut microbiome, the more capable you are of dealing with inflammation and diseases. Now, what tends to happen with people as they get older is that they get stuck in dietary habits. So, you know, fish and chips. I saw on the chat that some of you were learning to cook Jap Japanese and Chinese, amazing. And the older ones among us need to start doing this. So we need to start varying our diet. We need the classic Mediterranean diet lots and lots of different colors of things on the plate every day. That uh, trend at the moment for cooking Chinese and Japanese is really excellent because our microbiome really thrives on things like pickled cabbage and so on. And the other thing that is really good for your microbiome is intermittent fasting. So uh, I don't know about you, but during lockdown, when I'm bored, thank you, Roger, what I do is eat. So I kind of graze all day long, which is really shit for my microbiome because your microbiome needs to think that you're going to starve. So I've been trying to do the 16-8 diet, which by the way, doesn't mean 16 glasses of wine a day and eight meals, no, no. It means 16 hours without food and then eight hours of eating, not constant eating. Well, you probably could. So it's ideal to take 16 hours off or maybe a day a week when you don't eat at all. And the other good news for me is that wine is really good for your microbiome. Um, and I refer back to Alex here that he's probably going to tell me that medicinal wine and drug wine are two very different types of wine. Um, and uh, I'll carefully not listen to him uh, because it's my favorite autoimmune system booster during lockdown. So that's me. I don't know how long I took there. Did I take ages or are we okay? Uh, if anyone wants the, the, the big um, references that I used are down there. So do get in touch with me and ask me where I got all the info. And I'll hand you back to Lou, I guess. Questions? Thank you, Kay. Hey. That was great. Sorry. Ever. Um, that was wonderful. And um, uh, so I was just typing, but I'll uh, speak instead because I have this power of this magic microphone. Um, so we previously had a speaker, uh, Tim Spector, who's uh, one of the guys behind the Zoe app, if any of you have been reporting your COVID symptoms on a daily basis. But he was speaking to us back in the before times about the microbiome, cheese, all the cheeses, the smellier the cheese, the better. So to go with your wine, lots of cheese. Um, so I think that is good, good news for all of us. Um, Evie, have we got any questions for Kay? We do indeed, we have questions. So, so I start with my question and that is, um, if the immune system is getting weaker over time, how does that affect the autoimmune diseases? Should that, there, is it getting weaker but not weaker in attacking itself? How does that work? Um, it's, it doesn't get weaker in attacking itself because it's non-specific. So the weakness as it gets older comes with its lack of specificity. So it kind of tends to attack everything not very well. Does that make sense? Well, yeah, it's kind of crap though, but, but yeah, it's it crap. does make sense. Uh, next question is, does the less effective vaccine response in older people mean that the touted COVID vaccine statistics are averages on how much and how much would they vary? Yeah, so um, Tim Speck is pretty good on this as well. Uh, yes, that the stats are averages, and this is really frustrating because 
uh, older people do have a less response to the vaccine. So if, uh, I can't remember which one it is, but, but one of them has a 52% um, at first dose, but in some older people that's down at 27% at first dose. So yeah, we have to be very careful about these averages because uh, they are not, yeah, they're, they're averages. Right, um, next question is, what age is the tipping point? <laughs> well, that depends on what you're looking at. So unfortunately, the first tipping point is actually puberty. So your thymus starts to kind of check out when you're, you know, 14, 15, 16. So, you know, it's done all its work by then. So that is the, the real tipping point. But then, as I said, it's, it's got a half-life, your immune system's got a half-life of about 16 years. So every 16 years, you are halving your efficiency, if you like. Uh, the stuff that I read suggests that the, our immune system didn't really expect us to live beyond 50. So you're in real trouble after 50. So, so what is the prime time for your immune system? Presumably it's not when you're a tiny kid, given that, you know, these kids are always full of germs and, and well, mercury is like this petri dish of, of stuff. Actually, that is the prime time. So the more diseases that a child can successfully combat in youth, the better, because that is when the thymus is really, really giving it some. So yes, the prime time is when you're very young. And as I say, once you get to puberty, it's kind of over. Next question is, what is the mechanism for fasting helping uh, our microbiome? How right. does it work? Okay, I'm not very clear on this one, but it is something to do with, if, if the uh, gut bacteria think that you're going to starve, they sort of panic and they start processing everything. So your digestion really kicks in very, very effectively. And it gets rid of lots of things that you don't wanna have in there that might cause an inflammatory response. So yeah, your gut microbiome digests everything, including the bad stuff and just kicks it out. So I think that's how it works, but I'm not very clear on that. Um, Tim Spector's book, Spoon Fed, is very good on that stuff. That's quite a recent book. And also there's a book called um, Missing Microbiomes. I think that's what it's called. And that's also really good on that. Next question is, uh, are pets really good for our immune uh, health? If yes, is there any evidence that benefit continues for people who get a pet at an older age? I think this one comes from the same person who asked about the drugs and pets. So. <laughs> Um, I have absolutely no idea about the pets question. Uh, I because I didn't because there is of course a, a positive effect of pets on your mental health, but I didn't dive into the effect of mental health on the immune system. So thanks for that question. Oh, that's another rabbit hole for me to go down. Well, there's the next talk. Amazing. Um, a follow-up question to the previews uh, on little kids. Does the more exposure we have to illnesses when we are younger mean that our immune system would have a broader range of experience uh, to draw from? Absolutely. Yes, this is really important that if we can be safely exposed to lots of diseases when we're younger, then we will be much safer as we get older. Yeah. So let your kids eat mud. Uh, is... Let your kids eat mud, absolutely. Got it. Um, slightly odd one. Uh, there were some news stories a while back about blood transfusions from youth to older people translating into health benefits. Is that the same as your vampirism? <laughs> I think it's, it's the same principle, but not quite as effective. <laughs> um, yeah, I think the replacement of the thymus would be much more effective than a blood transfusion. Um, but yeah, so where do the, yeah, 
uh, it would have to be blood from a very, very young human, like a, an under 16 year old human. So that you had lots and lots of naive T cells in there. Right, I don't think that's currently legal. I think that you have to be at least 18 to give blood. I think so too. So I think also I a, a, lymph, a lymph transplant might be more useful than a blood transplant because I think lymph is where uh, cells tend to, T cells tend to hang out. But yeah. And next one, would the aim of this all, uh, presumably the vampirism, be to live longer or to live more years in healthy state. Okay, so this is another reason that I got into this. Um, I went to a talk at King's a couple of years ago um, about the burden of disease in older people on the population. And you know, much as, as an older woman, I bristle a bit about being a burden. It is absolutely true that we need our older population to be less expensive, <laughs> uh, especially if we're going to have an NHS. So it is really, really important that we deal with this immunosenescence because we need healthy older people, not expensive, sick older people. And part of it is on us as older people as well to look after ourselves and eat properly and um, cut the wine. And, and drink more wine. Yeah, drink more wine, yeah. <laughs> That's wine. what I meant to say. On that note, our last question for you is, what's your favorite wine? And I should rephrase, what's the healthiest wine, Kate? <laughs> well, um, my absolute favorite wine is, um, it's an Italian um, blend called Primitivo. And it's, I really love Primitivo, especially you can get a very nice organic Primitivo. Uh, so definitely, but today, uh, I'm drinking sparkling wine because 46th president. Here's to that. Uh, over to you, Lou. 